So let's all welcome Kenneth Foster. Well, hey, everybody. Glad to see you. This is an impressive turnout for the uh, for December in downtown Atlanta. Um, <laughs> it's actually nice to see this many people in a room here. Uh, you know, I... Uh, yeah, Kim's right. She's been trying to chase me down for like five years to come do one of these and speak at, speak at one of these. And I've, uh, you know, during different things, couldn't make it, finally got here to do this. And as I was thinking back on what we're going to talk about, and at the end of the year, I'm sure every one of you are just getting inundated on what's 2023 going to be, right? What are we going to see from a cybersecurity world? What's going to be coming down the road from 2023? Well, the first thing that came to mind for me was, Sooner or later, everything old is new, right? Because the funny thing is, the last lunchtime keynote I gave was about six years ago. And you, what I gave that keynote on that day was about business resiliency, ransomware threats, and how segmentation and what we needed to do there to make sure that we could recover from ransomware. Because it was the number one threat we faced back then. Well, what's the number one threat we face today? Ransomware. What are we still talking about? business resiliency and making sure that we've got air-gapped backups that are immutable so we can recover from ransomware quickly. Um, we're still talking about segmentation. Uh, we're still talking about zero, uh, you know, we're still talking about segmentation. We're talking about encryption. We're talking about identity. We're talking about good process. Just Gartner was kind enough over the last couple years to put a new name around all of that, right? And we call it Zero Trust now. So, you know, I think that's why I think everything old is uh, becoming new again, right? Because these are all concepts we've been trying to accomplish for the last 20 years, right? Least privileged access, good identity control, encrypt all your important data, right? Uh, segment it away so it doesn't get hacked from a desktop, which is our, uh, and the user, which is unfortunately our most easy target, right? And we're seeing that same conversation over and over again. Part of, part of what I am looking at as I look down this road and think through this thing is we are still doing, we're still doing basic things really poorly. I mean, I could probably throw a rubber ball in the room next door and hit 10 vendors over there that are gonna tell me that they're gonna increase my visibility and tell me, help me figure out what I'm supposed to do, right? And that's true, out of the, I think we're closing in on 42, 4,300 cybersecurity vendors out there now in the market. Right, and what we're looking at is <clears throat> another new term that's been, I can't remember if Forrester or Gartner came up with this new term for us now, but it's uh, posture management, security posture management, right? Put whatever letter you want to in front of that, right? Whether it's cloud, data, network, something, posture management, right? What it really boils down to is we do a poor job, and I'm not, I almost said what I was going to normally say, but I'm trying to keep this since we do have people online, but we do a poor job at asset management. We do a poor job at keeping that up to date. We do a poor job at just understanding where all the risk is in our environment. And the truth is, is to be successful going forward, we really have to become risk agile, right? We really have to understand what the risk is that's coming at us, how it's coming in, where we need to make adjustments, and we have to have a plan that is agile enough that allows us to shift focus and prioritize our teammates, right? Our outs because we as cybersecurity professionals rely on a lot of outside people to be able to do our job well. Whether that's the infrastructure team, the network team, the app dev team, even in a lot of cases, just the business teams themselves and the processes and how they're trying to accomplish business, we need them to understand why what they're doing creates risk and what the risk profile is and how they should approach that. The problem is, is we can't make a good strategy and good plan out of that without understanding what those risks are and giving them the ability to prioritize that. So I think some of the newest things that are coming out that Realistically, it's like I said, it's still an old technology, it's still an old premise, right? It's risk measurement, risk management, risk monitoring. Well, the coolest things I think I'm seeing coming forward and what I really hope to see move even faster is the ability to move to more real-time risk monitoring, almost continuous monitoring, right? I want to get us out of the point in time risk assessment, the point in time 
regulatory assessment because I guarantee you, and I just raise a hand. How many of you here think you could pass PCI in three months if you had three months warning that you're going to get a scan and you need to be able to pass it? How many of you think you can write the scope and get that in three months? It's unfortunately very easy to do, right? I can scope it down to this glass. And this is tea, by the way, for all you that know me. Just <laughs> but you can scope it down to a point to where, um, to where it's, it doesn't bring any value to what we are trying to do from making the company secure and minimizing risk, right? So we have to take, go back and take a good look at how we're measuring risk, how we're looking at it, how we're communicating that up the chain to the board, how we're communicating that out to our partners that are working in the infrastructure, working in the app dev team, and give them a real prioritized list of things that they should be approaching and why it matters, right? Because I can tell you right now, there's a lot of stuff in any regulatory framework you look at or any, even in NIST, in any uh, security framework, NIST, uh, ISO, you look at about half of what in there, and if you can tell me that every control language in there tells me it makes us more secure, prove it. Because I'm gonna call BS. Because there's a lot of it that doesn't really matter in today's world, right? Because it's a, it's a process-driven thing, it's checking a box, and the truth is a lot of those assessors out there really don't understand what they're asking us anyway. So I think the one thing you've got to look at is you take back and go back to these old principles. Go back to that least privilege. Go back to the segmentation. Go back to encryption. I had a great conversation day before yesterday, and one of the guys brought up quantum computing. And what is that going to do to us? And how is that going to be with it breaking encryption? I said, hell, I don't worry about quantum computing and then breaking encryption. I'd just be happy if people would encrypt the data they have today. Right, because how hard is it to get somebody to move to actual real encryption, not block level, partition level, hardware level encryption that keeps me from stealing a hard drive, but true field level encrypting cr critical data. How many people are actually using tokenization on sensitive data and moving to these, these principles that reduce our risk profile overall, right? The key to any program out here and what we should be doing is how do we reduce our risk, and if we can understand what that, what that landscape is and take a real honest look at it and not be out buying every latest and greatest new toy that comes down the pipe that's going to be the magic bullet that fixes everything, because we all know that's not true either, right? But sitting down and doing a real assessment on your actual environment, understanding where your actual risks are coming from, and put together a multi-layered strategy that's actually going to reduce that risk and reduce your exposure. So, you know, I don't like to, I don't want to sound preachy about it, but that's the biggest problem I see in our industry. And as I talk to all these vendors and I look at their product, there's some really cool stuff out there that's doing some really cool things, but it gets us to a point because I can have all the visibility in the world. If I don't know and don't have a plan on how to address it once I see it, I haven't done anything other than, other than show the world because now I've got visibility into it and I can't claim ignorance anymore, <laughs> right? One, I've exposed it, now you get into negligence, right? And I, I think we've seen a few things in the news and I'm not gonna get into that lately about CISOs and whether or not they're negligent and why they're in jail and things like that, right? But. Uh, <laughs> There's a, there's a fine line between just not knowing and true negligence. So the one thing you got to remember, the more visibility to get, the more you know. If you're not addressing it and don't have a plan to attack it, you're moving into that negligence side of the house. And if you get popped for that or get in trouble for that, that's on you for not having a good plan. Now, that's, and most, I, I've, I can guarantee you that I'm going to get some people go, well, that's really the board's problem because they won't give us money. Well, the problem with that is, is you didn't clearly explain what the risk was, you didn't give them a clear path forward, and you didn't sell your strategy in a way that allows them to fund what needs to be funded and quit funding stuff that doesn't need to be funded. So it's on everyone in this room to start asking those questions and communicate clearly um, and make sure that you're addressing risk in a way that everybody understands what that is. And it has to be in business language, right? You can't go out there and say, well, we've 
we're getting scanned and we're getting hit by, you know, 400,000 scans a week on our, on our edge. And, you know, the next question your board should ask, well, we're stopping them. And most of the time we are, we've seen them, so we're stopping them. Well, why does it matter, right? Does that matter to the board about budget that you're getting scanned and it's stopping? No, it doesn't. What matters is, is did it get past that? And did it get to the next layer? And are we able to detect that? And do we know when it happened and do we know if they exfiltrated data, right? Uh, last numbers I saw, dwell time now for somebody in your network is bumping 280 days, I think is the last numbers I had saw. So, you know, you would think with all these new cool things and technology and improvements out there that that number is getting lower. It's not, it's going up. They're setting in your network quieter and longer periods of time. And we're, most people in here do not know that they've been hacked for almost 300 days, right? So the question becomes not, did you know you got somebody got in? Did you know if they're moving data out? And then you've got to start asking questions around that, right? Did I encrypt it? Did I know it? Did I lose administrative access, right? So uh, another interesting stat from the other day was uh, I had spoke about this years ago that there was an article that 60% of your employees who make less than $70,000 a year will sell their credentials to access your network for $5,000 or less. So I had got to digging into it and I was like, I wonder if that's changed. It has, now it's about 10,000. So the price went up, but they'll still sell it, right? <laughs> so so it's, it's, it's an interesting world we live in and I think, I think being able to, like I said, get back to the basics, get back to the ability, and no longer can you claim an asset, by the way, asset, when I say asset, it's not just a server, it's not just a storage device, it's not a network switch or an endpoint. It's APIs, it's code repositories, it's entities, right? It's people, it is a lot of non-carbon based forms now that we have out there that are doing things for our teams. And it's great to do automation. But you can, you can use automation for evil just as well as you can use automation for good, right? And it actually allows it to happen faster. So you better have a good understanding of what you're automating. Um, automating a bad process just makes that bad process work a lot faster and, and get you in a lot more trouble. But you have to start thinking about nowadays in our world today, it's not just what our traditional asset was, what the traditional thing we wanted to move. You know, whether it's a container in AWS, whether it's a container on-prem, whether it's an old mainframe that, I know a lot of you in here are like me in the FinTech space and most of us still get to play with mainframes on a regular basis, right? Because 20 years ago, mainframe was dead. Yeah, not so much, <laughs> right? We've still got a lot of them out there. So it, it's about understanding that footprint. Um, so I've, long-winded in talk as I, most people know me I like to be. I'd love to get some thoughts and any questions out of the crowd on what are you seeing? What do you think are some of the biggest biggest things that have been around for a while that are going to still continue to be a major problem for us going forward? And before anybody asks a question, let him get to you with the microphone so the people online can hear this too. So, But I'd love to hear some opinions on what people in the room think are old problems, that we're gonna to continue to see grow worse. We got one right over here. All right. I knew Wolf would be the first person to ask the question. <laughs> well, I'm Wolf Halton, US Bank. And I talk to people on a weekly basis about good passwords, what makes a good password, and it's like, it never ends. I, I did a talk in 2016 about passwords, admin access on the internet, and, and expired and obsolete software and hardware. I did another one this year, same topic. So what do you think of that one? So, it's funny enough, I, 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 I wrote a guideline for, you know, I'm a year into my role today, 
and one of the first kind of things I sat down and wrote up because I had done it previous life, I wrote a document on what the difference between a password and a passphrase is, right? Because, and what, what makes up a good password. Truth is, is the best thing you can do for password is length, right? Complexity helps, but the best thing you can do is 14 characters or more. Even if you risk, read the NIST guidance on the way that they, uh, on passwords now, you, it no longer requires you to actually change the password unless you've had an incident or they recommend it, like if you've had admins leave or something like that, but it all gets down to password construction. So the longer the password is and the more easy it is to remember, and that's why the, that's why the special character stuff is not as important because if I asked you to create a 20, per, a 20 character password and tell you you've got to have three special characters, three numbers, three uppercase, three lowercase, how many of you can create that password and remember it 15 minutes after you've done it? I'm impressed because, and that probably means you've worked in a space where you've been doing this as long as I have, where you've had to do this for a long time, right? Probably working around the government or something like that, where we've been required to do that for a long time. So, I don't know, in the online I can't see hands, but I think three people raised their hand in this room out of a hundred people. Uh, you know, that's the problem with an overly complex password. But with today's technology, if it's over 14 characters, it's still basically, I won't say uncrackable, I'm never going to say that, but most people do not have the capability, the horsepower and the time to spend that much effort because you've got other controls in place if they're trying to crack it against there, right? Because you've got minimal number of times that they hit it and stuff like that. So the best thing you can do is put something together that's easy to read to teach your people to make long passwords that are rememberable and tell them not to write them down or keep them, as I got told by somebody the other day, I was having this conversation and he goes, well, why is that different than putting it in a notepad on my desktop? And I was like, well, it's not. So please stop putting your domain admin passwords on a notepad on your desktop that our internal pen test team keeps finding. <laughs> so quit making people's job easy for them, right? So that's a great question. Well, if it's, it's still a problem. User education is still one of their biggest. And I, I hate to say it's education as much as it's getting users to care. Right? We can educate people all day, but if we are unable to get them invested and get them to care, it doesn't matter what we do for training, they're just, they're just going to ignore it. Right? And I, I've often said that a user who can barely turn their computer on amazes me how well they are at getting around security controls so they can goof off at work. If they would spend as much effort bypassing security as they would doing their job, they would probably would be much happier and promoted instead of doing the same thing for year after year. It, it, it shocks me how good they are at getting around security controls. So, anybody else? There's one in the back back there. Um, Raquel Brown with Trimont Real Estate Advisors. Um, it's, it's un, it, it, fathoms me where we're working with our MSPs and outsourcing and trying to get some third parties to assist us and, and all that we have in our arena. And patching continues to come up as the responsibility and where that lies. Um, and when we try to impress upon the third party where, you know, that we would deem that your responsibility, um, their patching mechanism was way beyond, I mean, way below what we would expect it to be. And so we brought that back in house. I'm just curious what you've seen on that front. So patch management, uh, I don't like calling it patch management. I, I really am trying to get away from vulnerability and patch management. I, I really want to get us to life cycle management, right? I want to change the, the language we're using because Patching and vulnerability when we're dealing, especially if you're dealing in-house developed software, right? Uh, and especially if you've been, if you're not a new company that has come out in the last 10 years, you're dealing with old legacy product that it's not baked into the culture, it's not baked into the life cycle of the overall software development path. And the problem you have is, is it adds time. The, the, because you have to test it. You have to have it built in as part of that overall process. And I know the latest and greatest term for that is 
DevSecOps, right? Uh, in reality, it is a, it's a life cycle problem that we need, and a cultural problem that says you guys need to be able to build this in, you need to be able to treat it not as a patch or as a vulnerability, it's a defect in code, right? Because they understand defect, right? And if you can say it's a defect in code, you can't release with these kind of defects that we rate risk as a high or critical rate, you cannot release, right? That is a very difficult thing to do unless you're in a very mature, very well-funded, large dev security shop. It just takes, to, in today's age, it takes a lot of people. Now, is there tooling now that is getting better? Yes, right? The, some of the more popular code scanning tools that have been around forever, they were notorious for really bad false positives, right? And the problem is, is if you as a security person or a risk manager or whatever are looking at this and going, well, you got, you got 500 vulnerabilities that are showing up in our scanner, you can't release till you fix it. They're going to freak out. It's going to get escalated to the business. Next thing you know, you're writing an ex the CISO's writing an exception to allow this to get launched into production with a lot of vulnerabilities in it. Um, so it, it, it takes a lot of work to build a relationship with these guys and get them to understand that, hey, if you do these, these things, let, it has to be self-service. It has to be tuned and get better about getting rid of the, the false positives, and it has to be the ability to say, at a certain point, you're okay. It's that guardrail mentality, right? I put guardrails up, stay inside those guardrails, do whatever you want to as long as you stay inside the guardrails. If you try to hit that guardrail, I want it to hurt a little bit, right? I want you to have to do some paperwork, some documentation, something. If you're trying to go over the guardrail, I want it to stop you and then I want to have us a conversation, right? So it's, it's a process that has to be built. Uh, the great news is, kind of, like, depending on how you look at it, depends on which side you're on. On my side, it's great news. On app dev side, operations side, not great news. If you're a PCI shop, PCI 4.0 actually now requires that all code has to be scanned before it goes into production and it cannot go into production with critical and high vulnerabilities in it. They must be remediated in the development cycle before they can be released. It's the first time we've had a regulation that really puts some teeth, which granted it's not really a regulation, right? It's standard, more of a, a guideline, but uh, if you want to do credit card transactions, you kind of have to follow it, <laughs> right? So, but it, it actually is, is an outside entity now that's saying you must do these things. And I think you're going to start seeing that more, right? NYDFS has got a new amendment coming out that's got a lot more teeth in it. So any of you doing work in New York, especially in the financial industry, they're getting much more stringent on what they're looking at from your risk management pro programs. They're getting much... Uh, more stringent on your reporting to the board and how it's reporting to board and how involved they are. Uh, they're getting very stringent on, and if most people have never dealt with this, so how long, how long do you guys normally keep uh, security logs? Just to somebody, yeah, one year. one year, right? One year's the standard. Does anybody know that New York requires you to keep them for three? So if you're doing business inside New York and you're doing financial services, if you're not keeping them for three years, you're in violation of an NYDFS. Now, the funny thing about NYDFS is, is it's not a set fine. They do judgments, right? So they determine on how bad your program is, and then they pass down a judgment on what your fine's going to be. The last two I've seen the, where they caught somebody was $30 million and $45 million, right? Now, it was much more major than just not having logs for three years. There was a bunch of other stuff that happened in there, right? Don't, don't, don't let me go, oh, God, here's the boogeyman coming at you right now. It's just they, they had much worse. But they're looking deeply into your security programs now. They're looking deeply into how well you're communicating risk, right? If you're not looking at platforms that are out there or that are coming out on how to help you automate looking at risk, and how to help you measure that and how to put it in business language, you're going to be behind in the near future. Because having a well-designed risk management program that allows you to measure it against actual business revenue and get away from point-in-time risk assessments where it's near real-time, there's a few things that are hitting the market, and I won't mention the, 
the specific technology or names right now, and if you want to come talk to me after, I will, but there's a few things coming out now that where they're pulling real data off the stuff you already have on your network, whether it's switches, servers, uh, your endpoint, your EDR, XDR, whatever DR you want to call it, they're pulling the data through API layer, putting that into a model, allowing you to put some weights on that from a risk standpoint, and allow you to see in near real time what your actual risk profile is measured against a known framework. So you can measure it against PCI, you can measure against ISO, NIST, the CIS top, top 18 now, sorry, I forgot that, they just changed it, it used to be 20, now it's 18, right? So you, you can actually look at this stuff in a way that allows you to make an incredibly informed decision, right? And I think that's the biggest thing, I, that if you get anything out of what I've, what I've spewed off today here is make, do the effort, do the work to present the risk in a way that allows the business to make an informed decision. It is none of our jobs in here unless you're one of the CEOs or board members to accept risk for the company. Our job is to illuminate it, report it up, make sure that they understand it so they can make an informed business decision on what their risk appetite is and what they're willing to spend. And you know, I know a lot of you know me that have heard this, stop spending $5 to protect a dollar. Understand what it's actually going to cost to fix something and whether it makes sense to fix it, right? And you should be able to look at your program holistically, look at it and make that kind of decision and goes, well, this revenue stream makes us $100,000. I'm not going to spend $500,000 to put a new tool in to fix that problem. Now, I can do other things that are good basic hygiene things. Control access, network segmentation, encrypt sensitive data where it needs to, documentation inventory, have good processes for change management, right? I can do all those things without calling it zero trust. I can do all those things and protect and protect things in a way that is easier to swallow because zero trust is not a skew, right? It's not a product. If anybody in there is telling you they've got a product that's going to make your zero trust life easy, stop talking to them. I, and I have no problem saying that. If one person in that room tells you they can sell you zero trust as a skew, they're full of shit. So, uh, any other questions? One in the back, back there. Um, go, going back to the earlier question about passwords, isn't there technology available to go passwordless? And also the fact that now identity and access management, you have a privilege creep. That's the old problem keep coming up again and again. People move jobs or leave the company and identity is not managed. Whether people leave the company, leave the group, and uh, there's scope, uh, privilege creep as well. So isn't it time to use uh, password-led technology, context-based uh, authentication and authorization? So I, I had a little bit of a hard time hearing you. I think you asked about passwordless and privileged access management, right? Okay, passwordless. If it's a technology that is actually passwordless, yes. I, I do think that's going to be something that we all should be looking at. Uh, off the top of my head, I can only think of one, maybe two, that are truly passwordless. Because most of them have a password somewhere behind them. They're just, they're just hiding it in a vault and you're using a device to access, right? Um, there's technology out there now that's actually using certificates. So it's truly passwordless. So it's moving to an actual certificate-based access. It also is, has the capability to put, um, call it biometrics, right? Enough information around it to prompt you for your MFA and, your, and your, to re-MFA in, not password, but re-MFA in to your, to your system because enough's changed, location, device, something like that, right? So I do think passwordless 
is a great technology and is something we should be striving to move towards. You just need to be very, very careful about which passwordless technology you're looking at and validate. And trust me, I think I have tried all of them. And there are advantages and disadvantages to all of them. Um, there's a great deal of expense and overhead that comes with them sometimes, but start looking at the new stuff that's emerging that they're finally looking at the certificate based uh, because that is truly passwordless, right? And it's using an actual TLS certificate. It's actually secure. It's being generated nine times out of 10 off of your, your device using your biometrics and it's a certificate store on your device. So it's, it's not uncrackable, by it, nothing's uncrackable, but it's pretty damn hard to get around it, right? Privileged access management, uh, I'd, I'd posit the question, why are you not doing it? <laughs> you know, and, and why are you still, you know, we still have a problem, I think, in our industry of, it it's more of a cultural problem, right? Because the tools exist. Everybody knows the, be the, everybody knows the PAM tools that are out there and which ones work and, how most of them all work basically the same, right? They basically create a jump box or a jump portal, if you will call, log in through, log a session for you. It's token, it's tokenized at that point too. People don't know the password. If though it allows for your administrators to backdoor the server and get around that technology, what value does it have, right? So you have to make sure that you're designing a privileged access management system in a way that keeps your, again, like I said, if people spend as much time doing their job well as they did circumventing the tool because it changed the way they did their job, we'd be in a much better place. That's the biggest problem I see with privileged access. It's not that the technology doesn't exist and doesn't work well, actually. There's misconceptions about it adds uh, latency to the process. There's, uh, if you've done like I've done everywhere I've been, you, you make domain admins have a 20 plus character password and they complain, oh, that's too hard. And so then, or, or they figured out that there's a back door, to, that you haven't locked down the server enough to force all access to the server through that privileged access management tool. But you've got to do privileged access. I mean, that's, that's part of a, just a well-designed access and identity program, right, is having privileged access. Uh, you also got to make sure people are not using their domain admin account to just check their email on their desktop, right? So, any other questions? All right. Uh, we good? We're checking to see if there's any virtual. See if there's any virtual questions, please. Thank you. Stand by. Oh, and we got one here too. Hello. Hey. So coming from the DFIR space, and now I work on cyber insurance, um, I have seen this many times. We've talked a lot about preparation and you know how to prevent an attack. But a lot of it also comes down to responding to it to limit the amount of damage. And what we see time and time again that people just don't understand is just because you buy the best in breed technology, when that alert goes off, if you don't have the right people investigating it, then you're just like, oh, it's fine. The great technology solved it, we can move on. But then the attacker gets stealthy because that was your kind of first, hey, something's going on, and nobody does anything because they don't know how to investigate properly and look at the telemetry data and tie everything together. So we've seen this several times on the breach side that they were warned four months prior before ransomware was deployed. So do you see like a shift moving towards like MDR or building out internal, it's very expensive to build internally or like what do you see the future? Because a lot of times we're looking for that on the cyber insurance side of having an MDR in place or a SOC in place. So the cyber insurance world, by the way, is interesting, right? Because they are now actually hiring actual cyber engineers to come in and do assessments on you before they determine your insurance worthiness, right? And in some cases, uh, what you're... We haven't quite got there yet, but it's getting there very quickly. Uh, I have a... I have a real strong opinion on cyber, on what I think is going to happen with the cyber insurance industry. But, so they're already showing their hand, right? They've hired cyber engineers to come do assessments on you. I think we're going to see a CMMC-esque assessment and certification coming down the pipe from the cyber insurance companies. 
where they're going to say, we're going to measure your maturity, and based on your maturity level, we're going to determine what your insurability is, if, depending on your maturity level, and depending on your maturity level, we're going to determine what your rates are going to be based off of that and what your coverage limits will be. So I think that's coming. Uh, and I think they're going to charge us to get the assessment because it's, it it's something that can be monetized. So I, I, I think we're going to see that from the cyber insurance company. I think automated, any kind of automated breach detection, any kind of, I, you know, whatever, DR, like I said, you want to call it, detection and response, right? We can, for most companies, you cannot do this with people anymore. The volume of stuff coming at you. It's another thing even PCI put in there, if you haven't looked at that either, is uh, um, it now requires automated logging, a log alerting. It's never been in there before, right? It, it no longer says manual review of logs is okay. It now must be automated, right? Most of us are doing some level of automation. Uh, I love to ask this question, though, uh, uh, in, the, in the crowd is, how many people who are running security programs are part of this? have automation in place that it's actually taking action. Not alerting, not measuring. How many of you have automation that's actually taking action? Okay. Again, room over 100 people, I got three hands. And I've been talking about this a lot lately, right? Everything in there is selling us some kind of automation, right? I think automation is great as long as you do go about it smartly. And I do think automation, once you understand where the point is to allow it to take an action and where you need a human to look at it, is key to this. Because none of us in my seat or seats above me or what, none of us want to be the person who put automation in that takes production down, right? Because our biggest concern from this is that we're going to take a security response that's then going to shut down revenue generating applications. Because I don't want to have that conversation with the board. <laughs> right? Because that means I'll probably be asking who's hiring next very quickly. <laughs> right? So, yeah. Does automated action include creating a ticket for somebody? So, I'm talking more right, yeah. an actual shutdown. shutdown, not automated ticking. I mean, yeah, that. I don't really count that. I mean, that is automation, but it's not, you know, not what I'm talking about. Uh, great question, though, right? I'm talking about taking an, a definitive action on something that stops, shuts, blocks access to a system, to a network, to a, takes it off the network, you know, something like that that's actually going to cause things to break. Uh, not, not automated process around ticketing, change management, that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I think you have to have it to go back to the MDR, uh, you know, some kind of automated de de detection and response. You have to have something. Now, if you've done it correctly, it alerts to a point, makes you take an action, and, not, and you can't ignore it and, and not ever go back to it. Because we, I mean, hell, we've seen this as far back as Target, right? The Target breach was... They knew about that for, in their logs, had known about that for a very long time. The problem was is it was a constant alert that kept happening, kept happening, kept happening, and they just ignored it. It, was, it became BAU, right? <laughs> so they're like, oh, that's just an alert we get all the time, just ignore it. And knowing the volume of alerts that most of us and most of our teams probably see, it is very easy for to get into that mode that there's just so much information, so much data coming at you, Again, we now are starting to get into actually being able to put systems together in a um, cluster them together, whether it's by application, whether it's by the data that they've got on, whether it's by the network segment they live on. The, the most mature programs I've seen, right, we take our applications, we put them all together, we know everything that makes up that application. We know the switch gear that makes it up. We know the servers that make it up. We know the people that make it up. We know the data that makes it up. We know everything about that system. Then we can risk rate, rank those systems and go, these are our most sensitive systems. They have the most sensitive data. They can cause the most damage to the business. 
then we put the appropriate controls around that, the appropriate measuring and monitoring around that. And we do that for all our systems because we're going to come up with a set of systems that, I hate to say this, but we really don't care about, right? Because we've got them built out in a way they can't affect anything else outside of their little bubble. And I'm, I, I like to call it, most of the time you're going to wind up with, that's the end user desktop or laptop, right? It's the end user device, right? If I've got that isolated correctly and I've got it built correctly and I have that design around it to where if they get ransomware or they lose their user credentials, I can minimize what happens there. I'm able to now build an automation around detection and response that says, well, if it's happening out here, maybe I will allow an automated kick it off the network, isolate it till I can go investigate it. But if I have an alert here, I now have a thing that says these people need to be notified in a chain and these people must investigate and make notes and do things about it before we move to the next phase. Right? So it becomes about, comes about that process that goes along with the, the detection and response because it has to be mature enough to where, where you're not just, like I said, you're not just sending out an email alert or a, or a pop-up on somebody's desktop that they can press a button and say ignore and just let that keep happening. Because we all know our analysts get burnout. They get a lot of work, right? They're getting hammered constantly. And at a certain point, somebody's give a shit's gonna get broke. And they're just like, I'm not going to, just, <laughs> that didn't happen, right? And picture didn't happen. So <laughs> that's, what's, that's, that's my opinion on that. We gotta do something better with that. And we gotta figure out better ways to make that process easier for people. So. Can I, I have a virtual question? Yeah. You mentioned quantum computing and the threat factors they may present down the line. Do you envision that quantum computing will also help provide more streamlined automation workflows? Eventually. The problem is, is quantum computing right now is too damn expensive for most of us. The first thing that's going to happen with quantum computing is we're going to see nation states using it to attack people that they're, normal, they're already going after because they're the only ones that can afford to do it. Uh, there's some pretty interesting work though coming out. I think uh, it's coming faster than what most of us are realizing. There's a, there's a lot of really interesting work in there and I'm by no means a quantum expert at all. Uh, I know what I read and, and I'm, I'm kind of slow about reading so I wouldn't be, you know, but I mean you, you got to figure though one of the things I'll say and there was one more question over here so but one of the things that I, I've been seeing is you know like I said old things coming back. Hell, there's a new version of Emotep out, right? They're worried about the new version of Emotep. I told somebody, I hope this sequel is not as bad as the last Mummy 2 sequel I saw. So, you know, Emotep's back, so. So a lot of times, you know, we deal with being reactive versus proactive, and that goes into uh, data backup and recovery. So, you know, data is everywhere. It's on the endpoints, the desktops, you know, the Excel spreadsheet somebody needs. How do we see, like, data and recovery kind of moving forward? Data governance. You've got to build a data governance program, right? Whether you buy a tool to do it, whether you do it in-house, you've got, and again, it's an asset. Data is an asset. You've got to have an inventory of it. You've got to know where it lives. You've got to know who's accessing it. You've got to know how it's encrypted. You've got to know where it's moving to, right, and, and how it moves inside your environment. Um, ideally, you're moving it off the endpoint, right, because, you know, the world's best financial system is Microsoft Excel, and it's probably living on most of your HR, uh, it's most of your financial people's desktops, right? Uh, you've got to get that shift to where we're putting that kind of data in a place that we have more control and can limit access to it better. And then we gotta put things in place that allow, that keep people from moving it to places they shouldn't be moving it. There is a ton of things nowadays that will find the data, classify the data, tag it for you, help you build a program. Go look at one of those and, and figure out which one makes most sense for you. Uh, they're not all cheap. They're not easy to implement because you find out very quickly when you start looking at data discovery tools how broken the networking is in your large environment, normally in complex environment, when you're trying to go out and scan data stores and do things like that. Uh, but you've got to build a data governance program. Now, hopefully, depending on who you are, that that doesn't 
belong to you as the security person too, that they've got a team who's a, tied in with the business because the business has to be heavily invested in the data governance program, right? You've got to have the ability to understand how the business is using that data, how they make revenue off of it, why it's important, what parts of it are important, because then you can start getting into one of the key parts of a data governance program besides the protection of it is the minimization of it. Because there's way too many older programs out there that a developer said, I need this entire database to do whatever they're doing with it. And what in reality you need, you need two fields out of it. Right, so if I can limit the, the minimize the data that's actually living out in the network, uh, I tell you, if you do a little, I'm, I'm not going to regurgitate his stuff, but uh, I got a chance to listen to Bryson Kohler speak from over at Equifax and listen to what they're doing from a data standpoint and what they're what they're able been able to accomplish. It's a really great approach to a data governance program. So. Uh, you know, I, I, happy to talk about that offline a little bit, but it, it is a really great approach to how they're managing and trying to minimize data. So it's, it's a good, good thought process. They're doing it from a business and operations standpoint, but from a security and privacy standpoint, makes a ton of sense on what they're doing. And I think that's the other important thing about data. Security is a piece of it. The privacy implications are way more dangerous and way more risk to the company than the security pieces in a lot of cases because security, yes, you'll get in trouble and have a black eye for losing data. You lose the wrong data that has privacy regulations around it, it can cost the company a lot of money or in some cases could shut the company down. So. Along your latest thought, I work for a major retail company. Our stakeholders range from you know, the technology side to, say, the people who work in perfume. Those people have access to a lot of data, but they're also the weakest link. And they're always trying to say, well, this is an urgent business need. We're going to make an end run around the CISO and everyone else and, you know, security and in privacy. And even though we try really hard to have uh, a culture where, you know, these protections are in place, they're still trying to make that end run. And they will do everything they can to go outside the guidelines and timelines that we need. What recommendations do you have for working on that culture and that understanding? Thank you. It's a great question. And if I had a 100% well working answer, I probably wouldn't be standing here with you guys right now. But, uh, but it, realistically, it, it gets back into making sure that the people that they're in surrounding me to the people that they're running to, which normally are going to be executives in the business side of the house. Without getting punitive, right, and having some kind of punitive outlet for people who keep doing that, you've got to have a relationship with the executives that says, look, they keep coming to you, you keep allowing this to happen. Here are all the things you're exposing me to. Here's all the things you're exposing the company to. Again, it gets down to that revenue dollar. If I can give them a risk number in revenue, they understand that. And then I normally pull out a piece of paper that says, I'm fine, just sign this. <laughs> right? You made the decision. You're going to sign it. I'm not on the hook for this. Right? Because I'm fighting it tooth and nail. And if you're going to go around me and the CEO or whoever says, no, you're going to do that, I'm fine with that but you're going to sign this piece of paper and I'm going to keep it and it's going to be filed. And I, a lot of times when you do that, they change their mind pretty quickly. There's a lot of senior business executives, as soon as you ask them to put their signature on a piece of paper that says they're okay exposing this level of risk to the external world, most of the time they say, well, how long is it going to take us to fix this? And, and, and then you start getting a lot more buy-in and getting that fixed before it actually moves out into production. It's not easy. It, it's not, it, it doesn't work everywhere. Uh, it has worked well for me in most of the places I've been, but I still lose occasionally, right? Um, you know, 
sometimes you have to be willing to die on that hill. You just got to figure out if it's the right hill to die on that day. Right? So again, it gets back into how well do I know what the actual risk is? How well do I understand how likelihood of that getting done or causing me a problem? And am I able to communicate that and show empirical data that it, it, is, it is that kind of risk? And if you're not able to measure risk in that way, it's going to be damn difficult to have that decision and that discussion. So I think we got one back back there. Hi, my name is Tracy Williamson Davis. Um, just to add, you are exactly right, of course, <laughs> but just to add on that a little bit, I think as an auditor, um, as an IT auditor, a lot of times, well, sometimes, people circumvent controls because the processes need to be updated. And there have been times where, you know, instead of punitive action, the recommendation is revisit the processes. Um, yes, you have people who just want to hurry things along, but sometimes, the controls bog things down for the business. Um, and that would just be another suggestion is to look at the, talk to the people. You know, what isn't working? Where is it getting caught up? Um, up? And maybe consider updating the processes so that people follow, so you can update the controls so people can follow them. You're, uh, <laughs> you bring up a great point. I've had this conversation this week with the business is um, control design and discussing how the control is implemented and how we're going to measure that control with the business and why we're doing what we're doing is a key part to kicking off the year um, before we get into the actual assessment. It's never a good idea to be having control design conversations as the assessment is wrapping up and why the business doesn't agree with why your assessor is looking at that control in that way. So a big part of my job in, in the first part of the year is to sit down with the business and our external assessors and say, we're going to do a control validation. We're going to pick, we're going to look through these controls. We're going to talk through why they're in place, what they're protecting us from, and how they're going to measure you, and what we're going to look at, what we've collected traditionally to prove this. And then have that conversation with the business and let them be part of that discussion. Because you may find out that they well, you're almost always going to find out. They don't fully understand what the purpose of the control is or how it's implemented or how we're going to measure it. So if you have that conversation with them up front, it makes that go a lot easier as the year goes along so they understand why they're being asked the questions they're being asked. Uh, it's also not a fun conversation to have and not an easy conversation to have, and it goes back to user education as we were talking about because you're, you're educating your control owners. You should be doing that anyway but it, it is making sure that they fully understand how they're going to be measured, right? Like, I don't create metric package, metrics for, we'll go back to the vulnerability question, I don't create metrics around vulnerabilities without having a conversation with the teams that that affects. Because the first thing I do when I create, a, if I created a metrics package and just threw it out and said here at the next, next senior level meeting goes, this is how I'm measuring you, you're doing bad. And then the first thing that's going to come from the CIO that's getting measured like that is, well, that's all BS. Where'd you get these numbers from? Those numbers aren't real. So you gotta have buy-in up front. So it's, the, it's that relationship. And a lot of our jobs is relationship building, right? A lot of our jobs, when you hit a certain level, it's not about whether or not I'm the smartest guy in the room. That's for damn sure not true, right? I try to hire those people to work around me, right? So I now, but now my job is to make sure that my partners in the other areas of the business understand what I'm trying to accomplish from a strategy and that we all agree on how we're going to look at it and measure it and how we're going to approach it in the right way. Because too often I've been places early in my career where security was the hand grenade that the pin was pulled, thrown over the fence and go fix it and you heard them running away as they said it, right? <laughs> so, uh, but it, it's, it's a partnership and a relationship. So, so much of our job is, a, is more about building a relationship, building a culture where everybody understands that this is a team sport. It's a full contact team sport sometimes, but it's still a team sport, 
right? And if you don't have everybody all, all playing in the right direction, if I got people who are right, trying to run to the other goal line, it's never going to help. So it's about relationship building. It's about making sure that they understand that you're not trying to surprise them or not trying to impact you, you know, their PBOs at the end of the year because you, they, they didn't get a security task done and that you're staying and communicating. You, there's no such thing as over communication. There's no such thing as over reporting. There's definitely tailoring that reporting and communication for the, the audience that you're talking to because you really don't want to throw a packet capture over the fence to a CIO and go, hey, go fix this, right? Because he, do he doesn't know what it is. Now that's the, maybe the right discussion to have with the network engineer and network architect, right? So part of that is just figuring out where that relationship is and who you're talking to. And if you're not the right person on your team to have that conversation, get the right person on your team to have that conversation. And you and maybe his boss be in the room to make a decision if it needs to be made. But get your people involved. This is, this is not, we don't work in a vacuum. If you're working in a vacuum, stop. Start working, it's team. Get out there and build the team and work with the team and talk to people. Wrap it, wrap it up? All right, guys, I think I'm getting the hook here. So if anybody else has got any other questions, come find me. I'll be around the rest of the day. Thanks. Okay. A little